I'm still a purist, and I do believe that film, being the newest art of the 20th century, is a series of images projected on a screen, and this succession of images create ideas, which in their turn create emotion. It is to urge one, to drive one, to make one work purely in the visual and not rely upon words at all. I think what you've probably seen is 120 years of illustrated text. But however primitive the original start, genesis, beginnings of a film, you may almost certainly, 99.9%, .9 imagine it was scribbled down, first of all, as a text. You may have a novel, you may have a play, you can have an original idea, you can have just a couple of sentences. I'm still a purist, and from that, the film begins. Oh, you know, it says in the Old Testament, in the beginning was the word, sorry, that's wrong, in the beginning was the image. Hi, welcome to Vibration Cinema, the altered destiny of film. It has been a while, but we are back today to look a bit at cinematography, focusing specifically on visual storytelling, and then a little note on beautiful images. Let's get into it. So there's a strong and consistent philosophy to common sense cinematography that I just do not abide, which is that the cinematography should tell the story. Using that control of photography to tell and enhance the story. Using the camera and lighting to tell stories. You try to create a look that helps tell the story. How can color tell a story? What makes it cinematic is, is when you, the choices you make click together well with the story. <laughs> Wrong answer, forehead. The story should tell the story. You got the drama to do that. If everything is doing the same thing, for the same reason, in the same way, you end up with what amounts to a Dr. Seuss book. Only, the marriage between image and word in children's picture books is designed to help kids read. In most cinematic forms, such a tight synchronicity between story and image makes the story tedious, the image redundant, and the whole experience dull. It kneecaps the capacity of what cinema can accomplish in an emotional or intelligent way. Cinematography should not be reduced to filming plot points. And even when we do use cinematography to illustrate narrative fact, especially in today's mainstream movies, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Listen to what Michael Chapman has to say about this point. Suppose you're telling a story and uh, you have a, you focus on a man's face and he's looking past the camera and he has just, his face is just radiant with emotion and love and sexiness and everything. And you cut around to what he's looking at. And what he's looking at is a beautiful woman lying on a bed, whether nude or not nude, it doesn't matter. Now, there, the image should be beautiful. It should, the lighting should be soft and lovely and coming in from the window through the soft draperies and she should look gorgeous. And the whole thing should look beautiful. That's the point. It's her beauty and, the, and his love. And it should be beautiful. Then. Cut to six months later, they're having a furious argument in the back of a taxi. And she's saying, you son of a bitch, you burn, and he's gonna hit her and slug her. And... Now, should that be beautiful? Of course not. It would be counter, it would be counterproductive. It would be absolutely against what the scene is trying to say. So the cinematography has to be at the service of the story and of the imagery, not, and not just self-consciously itself. Now, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of like the ideation of gender, but this is such a rich take coming from someone who has worked with Scorsese, Ashby, and Shoemaker, who often use image ironically. It's also funny to me that the team at Cook Optics chose Blue Velvet of all fucking movies as the illustrative example of Chapman's point, because this scene is narratively ugly, sure, but it's lit beautifully. I'm reminded, musically speaking, of Tom Waits on songwriting. I guess I like, I like uh, beautiful melodies telling me terrible things. But even this kind of irony in cinema is just an undermining of expectation. It still illustrates the text, I'll bet, inversely. It doesn't visually express an idea independent of narrative. And unfortunately, we are in this post-irony world. Social media and Donald Trump has rotted everybody's brains, and the churning out of algorithmic slop to grow subscribers has trained people to expect Chapman's maxim regarding cinematography as foundational. If you say the sky is blue, audiences expect to see a blue sky. This pedantic legibility is part and parcel of the worst cinematic truism, show, don't tell. Which doesn't even make sense, because in the context of image as narrator or visual storytelling, 
showing is telling. There is no difference. Both are manners of relaying narrative information, one verbal, the other visual. And there's nothing wrong with relaying such information visually. It's just that films get boring when all they do is visualize story detail. But if you look at the rules of dialogue, the threshold of good dialogue is actually hard to clear. Good dialogue is usually concise, specific, with layers of meaning or interpretation, and memorable. Everything a character says is matched to what that desire line is. They really are communicating with each other, just not explicitly. When people say other than what they really mean. You want to say things without saying it, otherwise it's too on the nose. Got to move the story forward, so sometimes it has to be slightly on the nose. Good dialogue looks like a conversation, but in reality, it's a tool for continuing to develop the conflict of a story. Once the dialogue it doesn't have is it doesn't have the burden of telling the whole story the dialogue can play what a fantastic idea if only we could apply that to our common sense understanding of cinematography cinematography is so burdened by storytelling that any deviation from it is considered pretentious and distracting the visuals in a visual medium need to be saddled with this shit so that words words can have some fun this virtuous binary of cinematography as showing which is good and dialogue as telling, which is bad, forgets the fundamental dynamic of storytelling, dramatization. Let the story tell the story. And yes, the cinematography can give it dimension and subtleties, but let it play. If Tarantino can get praised for his punchy dialogue that doesn't move the story forward, then wacky frame rates, super saturated colors, oblique angles shouldn't be criticized for self-indulgence. When cinematography is merely reportage for the story, we wind up with the worst shot seen in recent memory from Widows. Nope, not that one, this one. All of the elements here in the shot, the dog barking at the door, the flask, all of the other Chekhovian bullshit at work here, clue us into who is behind the door, a shocking revelation, no doubt, but Jesus Christ, what fresh hell is this? Just raw pictorial narration and it sucks. You go to a famous exhibition space in the world, the Louvre or the National Gallery, and you watch the people walking down the paintings. Sometimes a little puzzled, they didn't understand the iconography, what's that painting about, etc. And then they bend forward and they look at the little legend underneath the painting, which of course is in text. Lady with a parrot wearing a red hat. That's what it's about. It's about a lady in a hat talking to a parrot. And completely satisfied, thinking they fully understand exactly what the images are, they move on to the next one, and so on, down the line, down the line, down the line. And you can see the connection that both, um, the both uh, uh, Chaplin and Eisenstein felt about cinema. There's a way, when the picture gets explained by intertitles, when the dialogue is written up there, when there's some explanation about, in a sense, film or theatrical uh, involvement to help you understand what you think you're looking at, then suddenly the image becomes, I won't say it entirely disappears, but it becomes curiously devalued. At the end of the day, motion pictures is an image-based medium. There's got to be something to look at sometimes even simply for the pleasure of looking. In our lost episode, a review of Why Do Fools Fall In Love, which I will link below, we praised Second Unit for its work on creating punchy and memorable cutaway shots. Much has been written and screen capped and praised about Ozu's pillow shots. Even still life painting can evoke myth and class and mood, a vibe, something. Images are valuable on their own, but also films can operate on multiple registers, so there's really no excuse for crap like this. But this is where the overemphasis of images as narrative lead us. Dull, bland, uninspired dreck, visualizing words. There are compounding factors as to why this is. Streaming, the abuse of ununionized VFX workers, capitalist hijacking of digital, modern design aesthetic, you know, the rogues gallery of 21st century filmmaking. But I do want to make it clear that my thoughts here are not siloed off from a broader discussion of the general state of cinema. What I'm interested in this episode is how in those machinations produced a want in consumers for visual storytelling and how visual storytelling is not much of a barometer for what makes a good image, a good shot, good cinematography, or even a good film. We talked on this channel before about the expressive potential of images and kinesthetics. We looked at 
how movement is inextricable to cinema, and how the sampling of motion can, for example, explicate ideas and emotions relating to migration. In 180 Degrees of These Nuts, we demonstrated how culture, not narrative, is the vehicle for depictions of cinematic space across the globe. Our realism episode focused on image textures. Even in custom couture cinema, we looked at how abstract an image can get while still being mesmeric, expressive, arresting. The point being, as we close out this section of the video, is that images mean things even outside of the context of the story. They can offer experiences beyond the page. When a shot doesn't tell the story and isn't a talking head, it's often dismissively called beautiful, and that is, apparently, a cinema sin. But why? And more importantly, what even makes a beautiful image? I'll tell you. That I have no fucking clue. That is something dependent upon personal taste, informed by cultural consensus, and something that shifts with the sands of time. But I've maintained for a while that the graphic fidelity of an image isn't a moniker for quality cinematography. Race, class, and empire are at play in who has access to 35mm, RE65s, 10-ton grip trucks, abundant and well-trained labor, consistent and legal access to accommodating locations, a well-funded set design team, and so on. I don't put much stock in polish and fidelity because of this. Unless you're a hundred million dollar budget film with white walls, what the fuck? But indeed, some of the best and most striking, most moving images I've seen look like they were shot on a potato. But the anti-beauty brigade aren't talking about these images. What I see in personal conversations, on the Bird app, on Letterboxd, is a consistent criticism for middling movies. It was shot beautifully, but the story is weak. They should have spent more time on the script and not more money on the visuals. This kind of stuff. And mind you, what they're calling beautiful images is an image with a bit of saturation that's in focus, has a clear subject like bare minimum shit you would find in what Garima refers to as a calendar image. Sterile, inoffensive, pleasant looking images. But it's a famine of beauty. It's a famine of beauty. It's a famine of beauty, honey. My eyes are starving for beauty. These losers who can't behold beauty certainly can't fathom that modern cinematography is in dire straits just like writing is. Capitalism is the enemy of film, not the camera. Images are too busy fighting for their own life, they don't have time to throw hands with the script. If I were to use the word beautiful as a metric for cinematography, I think it'd be amorphous. On one hand, I think the simplicity, clarity, and ingenuity of what an image expresses is beautiful. Edward Yang's Yi Yi is demonstrative of this. It's about Taipei at the turn of the millennium. We're dealing with a colonial history, neoliberal economics, and the, and the general malaise and alienation of modern life. How the film captures the city is interesting in this regard. The physical structures of this society, high rises, cars, and floor to ceiling windows, graphically distort the characters a visual representation of how these systems distort the quality of life in the city. Yang communicates the macro politics of Taiwanese history and its effect on its people clearly with this visual motif. It's such an unassuming graphic thing. If you were to compile these screenshots into a coffee table book without any of its narrative context, you'd still be able to get the point. That's the simple clarity I find beautiful. In the middle of what I guess we would call a beauty spectrum, I'd put faces a nice balance between performance and image. Look at the way the light dances across Brian Tyree Henry's face in this scene from Beale Street. It's haunting, a superb performance in a grave and immediate scene that is made all the more devastating because of the subtle shifts of light. For all of its narrative import, this scene doesn't work for me without the light shaping Brian's face. Especially on the big screen, the light creates for a transcendent, breathtaking experience. And finally, the other end of the spectrum is just because shit looks good, you know? Sometimes a little girl running around with a balloon or a Palestinian father gently urging his daughter to dance on the streets of Italy is spiritually enriching. Just casual observations of humans can be beautiful. These theater and literature geeks who are ruining cinema have convinced us that the worst thing a shot can be is graphically beautiful or self-conscious. God forbid we find joy in beauty. I, for one, do not look in the mirror because of character development. I look in the mirror to appreciate beauty. And didn't God reveal himself to Moses as a burning bush? A visual spectacle, which is to say, most decidedly, not as a sentence. And so you expect me to believe that the meaning of life the breath of human existence. The epic highs and lows of high school football. Can only be achieved through text. No ma'am. No ma'am.
Cinematography is a visual medium, but it's been reduced to an aspect of storytelling. Our modern American cinematography is not enriched by the history of other visual and kinetic arts like photography, painting, performance, dance, sculpture, and architecture. It's a tragedy for a culture that is so bombarded with images every waking second to have nothing to look at from a medium where craft and artistry is measured by the mastery of illusion, color, shape, and shadow. I'm begging y'all to throw away your books and use your fucking eyes. Before we go, I want to leave you with something that Yanis Kaminsky said at the 2018 NAB show. Cinematography is the art of light and shadow, visual metaphor and nuance. That is disappearing. It will evolve and come back, but right now there are not enough young DPs using cinematography to express themselves. And he's right, we do need to make images great again. But that's it for today. The last episode of 2022 will be my promise you it's not my sight and sound ballot top 10. Hope you guys are looking forward to that. Love you all madly. See you on the next one.